thank you very much for coming today on this uh, uh, on this busy uh, busy Wednesday. We're very lucky today with us. We have uh, Professor Neil O'Connor uh, to come and speak to us. Uh, Professor O'Connor is actually quite busy. It's very very hard to get a hold of him in, in, uh, in the, for an event. He's always traveling uh, off in the mainland China as well to visit the factories where he does his research. So we're actually extremely uh, f fortunate to have him uh, have him today here. Welcome to you. Uh, so uh, today. I will introduce Professor Rapala. I need to probably read your bio because it's quite, uh, quite detailed, quite impressive. But uh, uh, Professor Connor joined the University of Hong Kong in 2006. He was born and received, uh, he was educated in Australia. He obtained his BBA degree from the Ballard College of Advanced Education in Australia. Afterwards, he worked for Manju Charter Accountants for two years before pursuing a postgraduate diploma in accounting uh, at the University of Melbourne, again in Australia, and a PhD from the Griffith University. Uh, in Australia as well, very Australian uh, focus. He holds uh, several professional qualifications in accounting and finance, including the authorized supervisor of Hong Kong Institute of uh, Certified Practicing Accountants and the Certified Practicing Accountant degree, the CPA uh, Australia. Professor Connor has a diverse consulting and executive education portfolio with a wide range of companies in APAC. His work has focused on controllership, financial performance metrics, Human resource man and, and human resource management. He has also developed corporate business cases for a number of companies, including HTC, PKI, EU Design, Philips, Sun God, Sunbot Fashion, Alpharma, and uh, Rescom Real, Real Estate. His most recent research, which I, he's going to talk about today, examined the use of management controls in international joint ventures in China and the adoption of formal, ma formal management control mechanisms in Chinese SOEs. He's currently involved in researching how great firms manage their suppliers in China and the adoption of performance measures uh, in, in, the, in their operations. So thank you very much, Professor Connor. Thank you very much for being here. And the floor is all yours. Uh, Henry, thank you. Did I do all that? Yeah. I, 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 <laughs> unbelievable. Look, thank you to the chamber. I really appreciate the audience. And thank you for coming. If you've got questions as I go through, please uh, put your hand up because uh, it may be appropriate to discuss. Look, I could go all day on this. I want to talk about a few things today. How buyers manage their supplies in China. Specifically, how large buyers manage their supplies in China. There is a lot of books written about how to manage China, uh, Chinese supplies. There are a lot of books about do's and don'ts, the risks, what you should do, shouldn't do. I'm not going to talk about that. I'm going to talk about what actual practice is being practiced by large buyers. And I'm also going to give you some insight as to, well, what does the Chinese supplier, how do they view these managed relationships? How do they view these la large customers they have overseas? So just before I go into that, I'm going to cover the big picture, the total cost of ownership and some other practices. We won't, may not get through all of that today, so depending on questions you uh, ask, but the background, who I am, what I've done, there's some background given by Henry. I appreciate uh, going through all those details. Look, I started in uh, visiting several large buyers over two years ago, two and a half years ago. And, we, and those large buyers were making smartphones. And we've got three of them. And they're in the top 10 smartphone manufacturers, uh, smartphones you see in any of the, uh, any of the uh, telecommunications uh, companies in Hong Kong. So you've got uh, three smartphone manufacturers, we have a USB manufacturer, internet manufacturer, internet hub manufacturer and MP3 manufacturer. And I started off thinking, okay, let's do a case study on these. Then I realised that there's something more in here. There's something more in here about how they manage their suppliers. And so what I did after that was uh, I did a lot of interviews, broader, broader interviews, uh, part of another study and we spoke to many managers across a whole range of industries, toys, uh, apparel, uh, management consultants, electronics industries. And I learned a little bit more about well, what is the pressure that foreign buyers or actual foreign companies in China, what pressure do they put on their Chinese uh, suppliers? And I found that the nature of influence of the pressure, pressure to sell products at lower cost or offer more features at the same price point. We know that general cost pressure, you all know that. Or the influence from foreign customer buying power, margin pressure. Uh, more important than formal contractual stipulations. Of course, they go together sometimes when you're included in the contract. So what do I do after that? Well, I engaged in something that very few people do, that is you go out and interview a thousand suppliers. 
and so last year we did over 500 up to 613 now and the whole idea of this was to engage in industry in a more detailed way in something that has never been done before there's so many books on how to manage suppliers in China there's very few books written on how suppliers view these large buyers or how they view you if you're going into China. What's the supplier's perspective? So part of my message today is if you can understand a little bit more about how the Chinese suppliers view their, uh, this perspective, um, view this pressure, then you're in a better position to actually work with them, negotiate with these suppliers. So I've, I've done pilot studies, I just mentioned that, I've designed a survey, we're doing lots of face-to-face -face interviews, going to China all of next week to expose, to interview more suppliers. We want to get up to a thousand before the end of this year. So that's what I've done in the past. Look, if, if you ask large buyers, and some of you here do due diligence, I know people from Blue Umbrella here, uh, you do due diligence, checking out China suppliers. If you want to make an acquisition of a Chinese supplier, then you go get these agents to do this at uh, these companies. But there's risks, there's hold up problems, there are a lot of issues that you need to think about if you're going to go into China and buy a Chinese supplier, or if you're going to work with a Chinese supplier. But of these, this is probably the trickiest thing here. And when I talk to a large smartphone manufacturer in the top five in the world, what is your biggest challenge, the global operations manager? This forecast. And you can understand that because remember HTC back in the latter part of 2010, they released their Evo, Evo phone to the US and it sold millions in several months, more than what they expected. Many millions more than what they expected. And they had a bottleneck, they couldn't meet, up, meet the demand. That bottleneck was in the LCM module that goes in the top of the smartphone. So their normal supplier, Samsung, they, they didn't have more capacity, so they went to Sony, who doesn't normally supply to them. But these big manufacturers, they will work with their suppliers. So what was the problem there, that they only had one supplier providing the LCM module? No, the problem was they got the forecast wrong. Okay, so if you ask these large buyers what is their biggest challenge, if I can get the forecast right, I can manage the whole supply chain. That's the view. It's not about whether the supplier's going to hold them up or not. You've got to understand, and I'll talk, about, talk later, when we look at a smartphone like this, you've got 150, 200 components in here, they'll have two to three suppliers in each component supplying each component. It's not unusual for them to have 300, 400, 500 suppliers that they're managing. So we're talking about large buyers having hundreds of suppliers. How do they manage hundreds of suppliers? So I'll talk about that today briefly. All right, now let's get back to the supplier's view of the world. The supplier is down here, Chinese supplier. The buyer comes in, puts pressure in terms of training costs, product development, market pressure, margins, monitoring contracts. There's all this pressure that you're putting on Chinese suppliers. The big question is, how do Chinese suppliers react to that? Well, we have found out in the media in the last three or four years that, oh, we're going to copy. And that's that quite prevalent in the auto parts industry in China. There's a lot of copying going on. So for example, you have to supply to a auto manufacturer, you might go to another supplier who's supplying another auto manufacturer is running 100,000 units, we'll pay you margin, you run, do a run of 120,000, we take the 20,000. And then say it to us and then we supply it to the other auto manufacturer. That happens. So copying happens. Uh, milk and toys, you know the problems with that. Uh, for various reasons that come from pressure from, from the market again, outsourcing, cheaper materials, cheaper labour. Uh, we hear a lot in the media about the underage labour, things like that. All right, we understand that. All right, and, and connected, especially connected with toys, it becomes a very sensitive issue because of the market f for toys in the US and Europe. And also, ultimately, you want Chinese suppliers, you want the suppliers to actually improve their process, right? You agree with that? That's what you want them to do, but often they can do one, two, or three. How do you stop one, two, or three and get them to do this? Okay, I'll give you a real example, like Coles Meyer, they're working with 30 suppliers in Shanghai. Now you know Coles Meyer's a large 
chain in Australia and they're working with them uh, integrating their information system, the ERP systems, so they can move the delivery date from 80 days down to 40 days from product design inception. Okay, so what's big about that story? Work with the suppliers, then you can get them to respond in this way. You just put pressure on them and don't work with them, they may respond in this way. Okay, so that's my first point. The supplier perspective, how do I know this? Well, let's have a look at early part of 2011, the early part, we had 166 interviews done and this is, we ask at the end of each interview, it goes for about one hour each interview, what is your number one challenge? Not your five top challenges, just tell us your number one. Okay, so 30% cost control. Okay, that, I can see some of you are yawning. Of course, we understand that, that's a big challenge. We understand, we've got labour, materials costs, we know about ballooning, labour costs are doubling the last two or three years, some industries in the last 12 months. All right, sales, growth, maintain market share, product development. What's interesting are the small responses, that is, Paradigm shift is a challenge. Quick response to market, feedback, relationship, quality improvement, uh, going international, technology innovation. These are small percentages. But that is the long-term sustainable key for Chinese suppliers who want to become world class. Are you with me? But for most of these suppliers, they see these short-term challenges as their major challenge. But their major challenge should be over here, which can overcome costs in the long term if they innovate and move up the value chain. All right, let's fast forward 12 months. Okay, remember, 166 interviews, now we have 644. Okay, cost control, 28%. Okay, so we've added on another 450 interviews. What's the difference now? Competition was 7% originally, now it's 12%. Okay, why competition? I went to a PCB uh, expo, went to a touchscreen expo last December. And in that expo, there were hundreds of suppliers offering touchscreens for all different size, tablets, phones. And you're thinking, wow, there's more touch screens than there are products on the market. And we interviewed one supplier, said, oh, so you've got this major contract with this huge French manufacturer, 30,000 units a month. Oh, so when did you start the contract? Oh, two months ago. Oh, okay, so how long have you been making touch screens? Oh, for two months. Oh, what were you doing before that? Oh, we're making car seat mats in the auto industry. So you've got this competition just flushes, uh, comes in when they see an industry where the gross profit margin and we talk to most of these suppliers, they're working at less than 10% gross profit margin. And that's just enough for a flood of competition to come in and then push it down to four, five, six percent Okay, so there's a lot of competition. And it's really interesting that now competition becomes a larger challenge. Okay, so it's not just cost control. Sales growth, HR productivity, you can understand that, right? Like before, that was just a small thing here, now it's larger, nearly 8%. HR productivity, well, we've got lots of labour turnover. Okay, uh, employees have more choice. Employees have got uh, minimum wages now. They're going up 13, 20 yuan per month across the border. Of course, Foxcom and Co are paying much higher than that but for other reasons, forces that are going on in the world. All right, and, but we still have these long-term challenges that the most suppliers do not acknowledge as a major long-term sustainable challenge and that is things like paradigm shift, uh, again, uh, capital investment, uh, management, environmental sustainability issues. So not many people, not many suppliers are, uh, are marking these, they're really focusing on cost control, competition, sales growth. Very short term in terms of tackling what they need to do in the long term. So that's a background. That's a, I come to talk about how buyers manage their suppliers, but so far I've talked about the supplier point of view. You, you with me on that? And you probably think, well, what's going on here? Is this the wrong talk? No, this is the right talk. <laughs> if you understand better the position of the supplier and their challenge, then you're in a better position to work with the suppliers. 
because the best way to work with them is in a win-win relationship, not just cost down and just, if you can't make it, I'll get someone else to make it. Then you're back to the, the old days of going to China just for cost. And that's no longer happening. Okay, so I talked to another manufacturer who moved their manufacturing of those international power adapters that you know you plug into the wall and so you go into another country you just change it and you plug it in again so they moved their operations from China to Thailand what did you move what's wrong with China oh, number one labor costs have gone up they're no cheaper than Thailand now number two we want to protect our IP we still feel we're vulnerable with that because we view you know our design is part of our brand and number three they just felt that there was more transparency with how they run their operations in, in Thailand than in China. So it's very interesting. Now, does the electronics industry move around like that? Probably not. And one of the reasons is that the ecosystem of electronics is pretty well established in China. And so a question you might ask later, uh, near the end of this talk, is where's the next China? And you're probably thinking, oh, yeah, next China is inland. Yes, it is. The next China is inland, but not just yet. Here's the reason why. If, when I talk to some of these quality inspection companies, that is, I've got operations in China, or I've contracted with someone in China, and then I want, uh, I want someone to check before it goes into the container and then is shipped out, then we talk to them. They, across some industries, they're finding only 28%, 19%, 21%, 34% of product is passing in terms of average, average acceptable quality okay now that's not just the electronics industry it's across a whole spattering of industry so there's a bit of error there and Under, please understand that but I just want you to get your feel the same inspection companies are saying well you know we're up around 65 percent 49 54 so do you want to go inland do you want to save half labor costs yes but then the quality may be lower product labor costs are lower productivity is lower then add on the logistics costs so what's the problem it's not the logistics but when the inspector comes back and says, oh look, what we're going to fill up a container, only half are useful, we can't fill up a container, we need another two weeks. And so now you don't meet the market, and so you've got other problems, okay? So, yes, the next China is inland, but maybe not yet. Okay, let's, all right, so there's the background. That's the background, the, that's the environment of the China supplier. I'm gonna give another talk in the future where we talk about in more detail what these 1,000 suppliers are doing that I've been, in, been interviewing. How many of you know what this is? Oh, okay, this is a smartphone. Okay, so this is the, uh, the 3G and there you've got the, Ford, uh, the 4S here. I had a copy of this one but now it doesn't work because I keep on throwing it around and passing it around, but I won't show it today. But here's, how do you manage all this when you have different suppliers for all these parts? Okay, these large companies, and you can talk about Apple, HTC, and Motorola and all that, they are technology integration <coughs> companies. They, they are design companies and technology integration. They don't, say that they make the technology that is integrated. They'll design but not make it. Okay, so Qualcomm provides the major chip that goes into uh, the HTC, okay? And then you've got, you've got company from Europe that are making one of the chips that goes into the Apple. All right, so the Apple, the HTC, they don't, make, they don't make their own chips. But there are people out there that do make their own chips, like MediaTek, they make their own. How many of you have heard of this interface? It's not Android, it's not, it's not your Apple, but this is Cosmos user interface and it's designed by MediaTek. Most people don't know that, well we think that, okay, the main market, we've got to look at the smartphone market that's you know, going to go, you know, it's half a billion units, uh, if not this year, next year, and it's going to go even more, over a billion by 2015. What we don't know is, well, what is the market in Africa? What is the market in India? What's the market in China, South America? Well, the market is for phones like this. This is a copy of the iPhone. It's been assembled differently. 
but you've got a lot of uh, media tech products that go into these copies, okay? You wouldn't call it a copy because it really is different, okay? It really is different. Under some trade laws in developed countries, they call these things copy. Why? Because under the law, they say, well, if you can uh, convince a consumer that's the same, then by definition, it's a copy. But you look at it and look and feel, you, it, it is totally different from the real experience. But, so a copy might solder the LCM module to the PCB board where it's screwed in the iPhone. So if you drop this, it won't work. The iPhone does work. I actually dropped this on running the other day and it still works. <laughs> That's an example. All right, so you've got a huge market for this. You've got 300, 400 million a year already being sold in India, Africa, okay? Not just China, All right? So a huge market. This is called the Sunzai market. You can look it up and find out more about that. Okay, what do the big buyers care about? Do they care about the copies? Not really, because the look and form and feel is totally different. What they do care about is the following, and I talk about some of the performance measurement practices. Now remember, if we go into supply chain mode, how do we, what do we do first, second, and third? Where do the lawyers get involved? Where does due diligence? Where do the purchasing managers get involved? Where does engineers get involved? And so forth. First of all, we've got supply selection practices. That's where the contract and approval was done initially. Then you've got purchase order allocation and other monitoring practices that happen after that. Okay, so a lot of suppliers are banging down Apple's door to get a contract with them and there's many motivations for working with these big companies with a brand name. And one is, if I become an approved supplier of, then that makes me good, and then I can expand my market in everywhere else. Or I can do IPO, and then get the money, and then buy property. <laughs> okay, you know, so there's a, a whole range of strategic reasons why suppliers will want to work with these big companies. These big companies understand that anyway. So we've got TDQSC. How many of you have heard of that? Technology Delivery Quality Service Cost. And more and more now, environment. Okay, environment. But these are the main dimensions. Like there's 20 or 30 different dimensions that have been documented in the, in the industry. But these are the four, five main ones okay so let's have a look at what these firms I've got six firms here we got a, uh, we have three smartphone manufacturers and we have three you could say they're manufacturing products that are not as technologically complex as a smartphone and so notice the smartphone manufacturers when they're selecting suppliers number one technology you see and whereas uh, these firms over here, when they're selecting suppliers, we've got cost, we've got quality, and one put technology as one. Okay, so this is a Taiwanese company here, and they've, I'm going to uh, have a case study in that company shortly and talk a little bit more about that, why they put it as number one. But if you look at this, when they're looking for suppliers, at the selection stage, all they care about is their technological capability. Can you provide the production capacity for the orders for my future product roadmap. And even after it changes, and not just interested in selecting supplies for the next 12 months, it's for the next three years, five years. They're looking out that way when they're selecting suppliers. Some of you are aware of that. Okay. Here it gets a little bit more complicated now because in a selection stage, there are many people involved in these large organizations. Many people, sourcing, procurement quality, engineering team, so many people that one large buyer, manufacturer, had to hire a consultant from a large consulting firm you all know about, but I won't say. To, and that, the job of that consultant was to come in every year to bring these people together so they're on the same page when they're negotiating with the suppliers. The consultant came in to coordinate these teams, not to do the negotiation, but to coordinate the negotiation. Because these teams think of things differently. Engineering, design, uh, purchasing, it's lower cost. And then there's quality, it's not the focus of purchasing, but it's more focus of the quality department. And I'll go through the case study and tell you and show you 
uh, in detail how, how it is different across the two. So these big buyers, they have to, they have a huge coordination problem. It's not just coordinating 500 plus suppliers. They've got people inside your organisation they have to coordinate. So there's a selection process there. If you want more detail on that, uh, I just want to acknowledge uh, HTC because they gave uh, us access to write a case study on them. That's available through the Harvard Case uh, Research Centre, okay, the Harvard uh, Case Clearing House. So you can access that. I'm not selling it, but you can access it as teaching materials. Uh, so here's what, here's what a typical decision process looks like for a large buyer. So first of all is we select the supplier after we have our two, three, four, five hundred suppliers, what do we do after that? What do we do? Well, now we're going to decide, do we allocate a order to them? So every month, we've got 150 components in here, 150 plus. So we're going to make decisions. Do we just have 150 supplies? No. Okay, we're always going to have two or three, or four, five, or six. Well then, the order becomes a percentage of 100%, right? So for any supplier, the big question is, do they get 10%, do they get 80%? Do they get 100%? Very rarely they get 100%. Actually, very, very rarely. Very rarely. So, that's an allocation decision. What's that allocation decision based on? That's based on the rating that a supplier will have. And so one smartphone manufacturer, they have this rating system where they'll give the suppliers A, B and C. When they go down to C, there's only two directions from there. Either come back to B or you leave. Okay? And so the decision has to be made. Do we send engineers to work with the supplier to bring them back to B, help them out? Or do we just let them go? Okay? And this ABC rating is very important. It's probably made more on a quarterly basis and a monthly basis. Whereas they are collecting information on technology, delivery, quality, cost, service every month. Every month. Can you imagine the information overload? Every month and 500 plus suppliers. That's a lot. So guess what's going to happen? You've got 500 suppliers. You're collecting all this information every month. You have to make a purchase order decision. Okay, so what percentage are you going to give to supplier 64? Do you give them more or less than previous month? Oh, I don't know, there's a lot of information here. Look, we've just got to get the order out, so let's give a percentage. So there's going to be some error, there's going to be some subjectivity in that process. And so you're either going to overshoot or undershoot. If you overshoot, that means you give more order to suppliers that really don't deserve a higher order. and you shouldn't do that because you're rewarding underperformance. Or you give less order to suppliers that deserve more and you shouldn't do that. Why? Because you're not rewarding good performance. And so suppliers, the response may be the withdraw, improve, ration, poor quality. Or at the very minimum, it may be to not tell you that they're changing their behaviour, not tell you at all. So for example, some suppliers and their buyers have told us that the contract stipulates that if you change one thing in your production process or one component, you must tell us. And some suppliers will wait till they make five or six or seven changes, then they'll tell them. And, but they'll put it all into one. They'll put it all into one information byte. Okay, we've made one change, but there's really six or seven changes. And so you get this, in, this information game going on. Okay? So it, it's not just as easy as getting the right supplier or not, it's about constant management. So as you'll learn shortly is that a lot of these big buyers, what they do is they not only have an elaborate performance measurement system like this, but they do a lot of monitoring. So here's the purchase order decision. Okay, so our, our smartphone manufacturers, one of them Remember, three of them said technology, 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 and selecting. What about purchase order decision? This is that monthly decision. Do I give you high 